Well done, Bobby Charlton. Well done, Manchester United. Beckham. It's a shearing up. And so far it's played. Bobby Sharp saved it. United again. Ready? Welcome to United Hour, your official Red Cafe podcast for all things Manchester United. I'm your host this week, Nick. I'm Colin. And I'm David. Yeah, three panel show this week. Uh, I think last time you had on Imran and Ushwin. This time we've got David, uh, but from over in Canada, Scotsman on exile, uh, (laughs) Colm representing Ireland in a full Brexit podcast here this week. Northern Ireland, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, since last time we recorded, there's only actually been the Wolves game, which is like very little to talk about the actual match. But there was, you know, we'll definitely be talking about Bruno's debut there. There's also been the end of the transfer window. So, yeah, Garlo is somebody to start having a mention about. Uh, we're currently on mid-season break, which I'm not a fan of at all. I don't know what you guys think about all this stuff. But, yeah, we're going to have a brief t- chat about that. Uh, various other things to chat about and then yeah we will preview the Chelsea and return to the Europa League with Bruges Um, but yeah look this mid-season break I mean it's the first time we're having it two-week break me I don't like it at all and I just think it's pretty ridiculous as well that the amount of matches that were crammed into like December January and then again we're going to be cramming them in and just like absolutely knackering the players just to let them go and have like a week's holiday in like Marbella and whatever uh, but I don't know what you guys think of it. You think it's something of use that they should keep in again or get rid of it now? I mean, Klopp's obviously made this big stance. He's been banging on for a couple of years about how England's the only league that plays right through or one of the only big European leagues that plays right through. Um, and he's kind of done his mini strike this year with the FA Cup and all that kind of stuff. I don't mind it, but from my own selfish perspective, I've been really bored. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I, I just like, I love when we're, I even love when we're playing you know, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday, Tuesday, so, you know, whatever it is. And I know it's brutal and I know it's a big problem for our season this year, obviously. Um, but I, I, I like watching as much football as I can. And I'd rather watch United than having to go to other leagues or watch other teams and stuff like that. Um, I I, st- I said it earlier, but I'd still rather we just got rid of the Carabao Cup. I just don't see why we need two domestic cup competitions. I, I, think, it's, I think it's silly. I think it should just be dropped off the radar. I don't think anyone would care or notice. Yeah, with the last ones, who still have a second cup because I think France just got rid of theirs. The only thing is, you know, it's all complicated between the Premier League and the FA because the Carabao Cup is kind of like the League Cup and, you know, it's different organisations who all want to have their own importance. Yeah. But yeah, other things like replays, two-legged ties and whatever, is something definitely you see looked at. But I can't see that this season break is helping the team just because the amount of matches we've had to play to fit in this two-week break. I um, mean, it already seems like an age since we played Wolves. <laughs> um, it's probably a very fair argument to say, would you rather, because as you say, there's been a bunch up in the schedule to accommodate this kind of break for everyone. So is it better to have a more equal spacing throughout the year or have a more congested, you know, December, January and then a week off and then go immediately back into a congested February, March kind of thing, you know. So I'd, I'd say it'll probably be a, in a different iteration next year if they do carry on with it. I don't see it'll be like this again. Yeah, let's see how that goes. But yeah, so I mean, looking back at that Wolves match, which does seem ages ago, but there wasn't that much to remember. A nil-nil draw. I mean, yeah, we've just played Wolves way too many times. I think people are kind of bored of playing them. Uh, but yeah, I think we start straight in with Bruno's debut, right? I mean, what did you make of him? Calm on his debut. There'd been so much rumour and this and that, smoke and mirrors in the transfer market. Finally, he showed up uh, just, you know, what did he come? It was about three days. Did he have in training before that match? Yeah, it wasn't long. We were all sort of thinking, would he start or wouldn't he start? But then with obviously the <laughs> complete lack of bodies we have, I think it was always pretty much nailed on that he would start. Um, I thought he was really, really good. I really enjoyed his performance in a very... Uh, banal game that was I think very difficult for him um, I mean he was played beside Mata and Pereira so three tens on the pitch and I don't know how anyone ever expected that to yield uh, too many dividends but he for himself I thought looked really sharp passing you can just see he's crisp he's technically uh, quality he wants to force the issue he was constantly looking forward good movement there was a lot of point and gesture and leadership qualities that you were able to see although I don't think you can take too much from one game in that respect and then he had, you know, that that sort of driven chance. He had the free kick. Um, although, interestingly, he ended up playing, you know, as a six, really, um, or an eight. Um, so, kind of interesting to see the player we all wanted in the summer to fix our 10 issue come in finally in January and play uh, beside Fred in midfield, basically. Um, and obviously, that's an injury thing. Yeah, I'd say eight, right? Fred's the six. I mean, yeah, he does look very similar style of player to Pogba. 
and the only question is whether they'll ever actually play together or is he just his replacement? Uh, I mean, yeah, we don't really know whether we're going to see even Pogba much more this season yet. Depends how he comes back from this surgery and everything he's had. So, yeah, we have to wait and see. But, yeah, and we knew that even without when Pogba was around that we still needed somebody else to do that. Well, we still wanted a 10, you know? Yeah, we all wanted him in summer when we thought Pogba was... Co- well, we didn't really think Pogba was committed in the summer, but we thought we were keeping him and we all still wanted a 10. I mean, we knew rightly at the start of the season that an ageing, if still very charming, Mata, uh, Pereira and Lingard was, was never going to be serviceable in terms of 10s, particularly when you consider how little we have going off uh, right wing, you know? So uh, to me, it doesn't have to be one or other, but it looks like it kind of is now, you know? Yeah, the one thing I really liked about Bruno was just that he does obviously have some character. You know, he immediately he was ready to step up, take some responsibility. Didn't He wasn't like overawed by this move of going to United. And yeah, some people who haven't looked maybe at his history might think he's, you know, he's played all his life in Portugal. But yeah, he actually went quite young out to Italy. Didn't maybe work out for him, but he was, you know, pretty rated as a young player. Maybe actually made that kind of move too early, went back to Portugal. And now he's having another go. Uh, uh, moving on in his kind of la- career ladder, I guess. Um, but yeah, look, he seems up for it, step forward. But I did actually think he gave the ball away a fair bit. Um, you know, but when you're going for those riskier balls, I guess, you know, you have to take a bit of that. And there was too many of our players who are always going for the safe ball. Yeah. So exactly why we need somebody like Bruno. You'll always give someone a bit of slack if they're trying something. You know, I'll always forgive a forward pass or an incisive pass, even if it's done poorly. And also I think a lot of time is that he's playing passes in it with where he's expecting runs. Obviously, you only train with a team two or three days and it's going to take a, a, a little while for him to kind of, well, hopefully it doesn't bed too much into our style of player otherwise we'll just ruin, ruin another good player but I think a lot of times he was playing balls where you expect runners and the runner maybe wasn't there or maybe just wasn't you know quite at that level or at that pace um, to, to make the most of it but it was very encouraging it's, it's a big big um, shining light at the moment and I just hope that there's not too much pressure put on his performances you know for him to immediately come in and start throwing around the kind of numbers that he was he was um, dishing out in Portugal um, because you know it's it's probably too much to ask but it's it, you know he is really a very exciting prospect for us at the moment I know many people used to say when they join a the team they say that they dream of playing the team you know mine was not the case mine is I supported the team when I was young. People that knows me, even back in Nigeria, everywhere, even when I was playing in Watford, my teammate knows that. I love Man United. I support them when they play, even when we play against them. When I play against Man U, that emotion is there because it's my dream. So now it's reality. So I'm very happy and I'm looking forward to start. From what I've seen of Igal, I think it actually is true that he has actually grown up a fan of United over in Nigeria, where I know there is actually a massive United fan base out there. Shout out any Nigerian listeners. Well, I was actually going to say that I think from a marketing point of view, I'm sure this has crossed Woodward in whatever's mind that like how many shirts are we going to sell in Nigeria? And, and you know, unfortunately, I think these things actually do come into the thinking nowadays. Um, but yeah, he, I think... The guy looks like he was ready to come for us. They say he's taken quite a big pay cut. Uh, two two hundred grand, yeah, two hundred grand a week or something, or two hundred grand, yeah, whatever. Something. I've seen basically. I think he was on something between two hundred and three hundred grand a week, and he's probably on about a hundred now. Uh, that's a slightly bizarre thing that you know we bring in Bruno at whatever 60, 70. 60, 70, 80 million, yeah. and he's. I think on less money than Igalo will be coming in on, even though Igalo's taken a fifty percent pay cut. It was um, a hugely endearing interview that he gave, though. Um, you know, I think when we signed him, there was there was that initial, uh, you know, why is this guy who played for Watford three seasons ago and didn't do amazingly well? The thing is, though, as well, if you look at some of the names that were on the list, yeah, there was, I don't know, Rondon. Well, that, uh, I mean, <laughs> there was a lot of Josh King. We obviously, we definitely did go and inquire. Yeah, so my God. I mean, Josh King was one that I, I also wouldn't have hated him. And I think Agallo were the two picks for me. The, the issue with Josh King is he's coming from the league. You probably have to buy him. You probably have spent 30 million on him. Then you have to offer a contract and he's going to be with the club for four up years. The great thing about Agallo is it's a loan. You know, there's, there's literally zero risk whatsoever except paying his wages. And even that's absolutely fine given the complete lack of bodies we have at the moment. King's also had injury issues and the last thing we yeah. needed was another player who wasn't definitely 100% fit and ready to go. And that's the other thing for Igalo, he's going to be totally fresh because, uh, you know, the Chinese league was only just going to be starting. And, and committed, you know, I can't overstate that, you know, being a fan, the enthusiasm in his interview, the wanting to take the pay cut, the saying, you know, I don't care about the agent, just get me there. This is, this is you know, my dream, all that kind of stuff. Like, it's hard not to really buy into that, I think. And I just really 
hope he has like a decent run for us from now to the end of the season. I think people talking about, you know, keeping him on afterwards and clauses and all that kind of stuff. You just need to wait and see how well he does because it, it could be pretty poor form, to be honest. And, and we don't actually know how much he's going to play. There's talk that he really needs to get up to speed. I don't think he was able to go out um, on the hot weather training due to coronavirus issues. Um, but I would hope to see him ASAP because... Martial just looks such a frustrated figure up there on his own without Rashford. Um, and I don't think it's all his fault, but it's certainly not a great month for him by any stretch of the imagination. And a guy who's ready to go, like, throw him in. Like, what's, what's the worst that can happen? You know? If you look as well, he's actually got a pretty good goal-scoring record. Even in the Premier League, uh, he had two pretty good seasons for Watford, then he had one bad season. I think it was one of those where he'd kind of already wanted to move away and it didn't happen. And then he ended up taking the big money and heading out to China, where I think he's been for two or three seasons and has actually scored a fair amount of goals. I think it was something like 45 goals in about 75 matches. But <clears throat> Top goal scorer in the African Cup of Nations. Yeah, top goal scorer, golden boot in the 2019 African Cup of Nations, which is, yeah, pretty good for sure. That's relatively recently as well. So yeah, look, the guy definitely knows how to score a goal and could exa- is he exactly that. What would they always say? I want to break... break a- your nose striker is going to break his nose to and this is exactly the type of player he is uh so yeah no i'm quite excited to see how he fits in over there uh just because yeah we, we needed something that's for sure but people complain about it it's like you know you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't because they're saying oh this you know first of all anyone who says anything uses the word embarrassing about their football club and their followership of it just needs to go and have a long look at themselves in the mirror I think because it's not embarrassing that we you know we've brought in Henrik Larsson Mike Lowe we've brought in stopgap players before it's not it's no issue and he's here on a loan like there's literally no risk to it there's it's not a marquee no one's saying this is our plan for the next five years you know so I think those kind of things just need to calm down and look at it more um realistically but also you know we just need players like that's that's the bottom line and the way we've brought him in is, is the best way you could have conceived. And I think it's actually probably another slight feather in the cap of the recruitment process that has been going on since Ole come in because they didn't... It would be very easy to spurge some money on an average striker who you're then lumbered with for three to four years or two years or whatever it is. But that wouldn't actually be a wise decision. And it's kind of short-term gain for long-term pain as opposed to the opposite, which I think is the one big credit for Ole this year is that he has been willing to risk his statistics, his overall performance levels for what he perceives as the good of the club, I think. And I think that's been quite obvious. Whether you agree or whether you disagree or whether that makes him a good manager or not is, is a whole different thing. But this is another example of not just rushing to kind of stick a plaster on something that's a bigger issue and actually getting, okay, an underwhelming signing, but a stopgap in who desperately wants to be here and, and will give it the best and then wait and hopefully make an, a, you know, a better appointment in the summer or wherever, whatever else. So I think it's credit to the to the um, job. I mean, you look at Chelsea and who you know Spurs and how they struggle to bring players in. Um, and January is tough and I think we did pretty well the way the transfer business went is that I don't think we were planning to bring in a striker until Rashford got injured Uh, whereas I think you know it was quite a need already and it also seems that you know I'm not one who likes to look at all the transfer rumours and whatever because I always think 90% of what's in the press is total garbage but um, it's pretty clear from things his agent has said and even him himself said that it was only maybe two or three days before the closing of the window that we had made any approach for Odio Negarlo. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that does just beg the question then, well, who would we have been looking at for the kind of two, three weeks before? Because <laughs> you assume something had been worked on and how far down the list did we get before it was Igarlo? Uh, there's so many names are thrown out there, Puki, Ings, as if like any of these players are going to move in this window. And I think maybe the club did waste a lot of time trying to bring in players they hoped they could get, but really there was no chance uh, when players, you know, clubs are fighting for their survival and the only way they're going to stay up in the Premier League, they're not going to sell you in January like no. their best goal scoring options because yeah I think with a few days left off the transfer window not everybody was confident of bringing anyone in really and we had quite a few comments I know amongst ourselves where two or three were saying I don't think anybody's coming in now I, I, I told everyone that I had it on good authority that Bruno was done and I was committed to that the whole way through and it just was typical it was just like no, and you know I said all the way through just Bruno like the wan deal, like deal quite like the Harry Maguire deal it's just this seems to be the way we operate now and I think um I think you have to, it's very easy within the transfer window to get very frustrated because you're, I mean, I don't know about you, Nick, obviously you're, you're just looking at the BBC every day for updates, but like the rest of us are looking at the transfer tweet page, we're looking at Twitter every single day, we want those updates, we want everything to move at a million miles Yeah, an hour. for me, that's all just a total waste of time because like I say, to filter through all the absolute bullshit and get to what's actually it's quite true. enjoyable, it's quite enjoyable. You know, I always it's, say, unless yeah. it's on BBC, I'm not even interested. 
And because uh, for me, that's the kind of source filter of when it hits that point, there is actually something solid going but on. But I think when you remove yourself from that actual uh, in the window mentality of just being like a crack addict needing more transfer updates and actually look at the outcome, I think that's the only real good way to judge it. And actually, I think if you look at the last two windows, I think you can only say they were both good. There's just a limit to how many players you can buy. And, and there should be a limit to how many players you buy because I think a lot of people want us to sign five. You know, why didn't we sign Bruno in the summer? That's the one I think we could have, the extra one we could have done the summer. But, you know, Real bought like five players and it doesn't necessarily work out that well. You know, it doesn't get you there quicker necessarily. You have to build it, I think, as you go. And I think that's actually not a bad thing. And I think when you look back at things, you know, the, the three signs we made in the summer all bedded in relatively well. Question marks for me over Dan James and Aaron Wamsaka going forward, but, you know, very happy to have them, um, particularly the two defensive players. And now Bruno, I think I'm pretty confident he'll be a, a good, good, good player for us all being well. Um, and Agallo was just a, a punt to help us out to the end of the season. But it just it just puts more focus on the summer again because it's a huge, huge, huge window. Yeah, I mean, even just today, there had been some comments from Ed Woodward. I think there was a fans forum kind of get together and, I think this happens every quarter and there's different representatives. There's like, I've seen this before, like as a season ticket holder, you get invited to apply if you want to be on the fans forum and they take somebody, a couple of season ticket holders. I think there's always like uh, maybe somebody representing some different like of the club. um, What do you call them? The kind of, you know, regional fund members clubs basically they get a couple of people in from there some somebody representing the youth somebody will be like somebody from under 21s i think there's a forum of about 10 different kind of categories of our fans uh, who all come and give their views and yeah woodward was speaking there as is the way for woodward it was a pretty kind of bland kind of what you expect statement all very planned out uh, you hear all these things before you know making all the right noises that yeah we're working on transfers there's a lot of money available we know things aren't so great so far but you know there's plenty of money available in the summer to improve again it's a process blah de blah de blah I mean, uh, I don't know what you think about these kind of comments, Colm, or is it all just meaningless to you now? Uh, it's pretty much meaningless, I think. Um, you've just heard it so many times, you know, and it's so easy to say. I mean, I could have wrote that script. I mean, I read it today and just thought, oh, it sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds like a well-run club. Sounds like he gets it. Um, and yet, in reality, you're not always left with that much confidence. You know, I know I've just said that the recruitment... Um, in terms of what has actually what what quantifiably has been brought in, I'm happy with. Still, the nature of it doesn't inspire me with a whole pile of confidence. Um, but I think credit where credit's due, it has been decent over the last two two um, windows. The sort of talk about knowing that we're not, you know, it's not kind of great at the moment, but that there's a clear plan. Um, to me, suggested um, it was kind of a vote of confidence for Ole. Um, it, it was sort of like, look, we're happy with this. We see what's going on behind the scenes. We know that there's going to be pain in the short term. We know it hasn't been a good season by any metric. Um, but we see a light at the end of the tunnel, and we kind of trust in that, and we're going to spend money on that in the summer. It all sounds great. Um, I'm still of the of the mindset that I'd rather was potching in the summer or something like that. And I know we've said, you know, we've given votes of confidence before from a kind of a board level only to sack the person the next day or whatever. So I wouldn't read too much into it. And I think that's basically the big takeaways. It all sounds great, but people who are sort of looking at it thinking, oh God, Ole's going to be here till next season regardless, even if we finish ninth and he's going to be given all this money and that's awful. I, I don't think it's say, I don't think it means that in the same way that it doesn't mean that he's going to be sacked. You know what I mean? I think there's very little you can actually take from it. Oh, yeah, I mean, we've, as soon as this window uh, winter break finishes, then we've got Chelsea up Monday, six pointer. It's all about our top four chances. I asked earlier today on between all the guys who do the podcast, where do you think we're going to finish this season? Because now that the transfer window is over, you can start thinking about that. The squad is set, and I think we had various things going. Everything from fourth was the most optimistic prediction, all the way down to ninth. From who said fourth? Uh, Ed, Ed said fourth. Ninth came from Rob. In fairness to Rob, Rob said ninth at the very start of the season. He, he said ninth right at the start of the season. He said he was kind of semi-joking about it, but he was really pissed off right at the start of the season about the transfer window and said that, you know, we've not bought in enough players and if we have a couple of injuries that we're going to be totally screwed. And Perfect. yeah, he actually turned yeah. out to be totally on the money on that, to be fair. Uh, he had the most pessimistic view and it all came true, basically, when, you know, we lost Pogba, lost Martial, now Rashford, all those kind of... I mean, you said, you said pessimistic. Pessimistic, but he wasn't really pessimistic about it. You know, like obviously ninth immediately sounds pessimistic, but he's just adjusted his 
reality, his outlook to rea- to match reality, essentially, he was just right. He, he didn't say, you know, oh, I think Ole's crap and I think we're rubbish and I think all our players are rubbish, so we're going to finish ninth because we're useless. He said, you know, we're a mid-table team with a few really good players and if those players get injured, then we'll be a mid-table team, so probably around eight or ninth. And that's, like, I don't know, but every time we play Wolves, I just think, God, these, these are just the same teams, you know, playing each other all the time. Yeah, but I do think that, like, to say that Wolves and United are, like, you know, mid-table, whatever, they're not. They're at least fifth, sixth, seventh, like, bare minimum, right? Okay, yeah. But, yeah, I understand why he said it. And to be honest, it looks almost more realistic. Point off it at the moment. But then, yeah, yeah. that's I didn't expect to play most of the year without Pogba. Uh, but I still say that my personal prediction... Is going to be, yeah, I always try and keep like glass half full, but yeah, fourth, fifth is where we're going to be. Yeah. Uh, where are you calm? Where are you calm? I think fifth or sixth. And I'm really, I think sixth yeah, or sixth. So it's sixth. not that much difference. Like you were only talking about. The way I thought about today. No, but what? Yeah, wait, wait. You've got to pick yeah. two, two, two positions. Then I would say sixth, fourth, seventh. Fifth. Um, six, I seventh. Think you said, cause you said cause fifth, the way, six, the way, well, Let me explain myself. The way I looked at it earlier was that I think Chelsea will get fourth. Um, I think they will not be as bad as they have been in the last two months for the rest of the season. Sheffield United, I think, are very good value. They just eke out results. We saw that last minute winner there here because they are playing football this weekend, apparently. Um, from Ludstrom, fantasy football legend. Um, yeah. So I just... Came off my yeah, bench. Yeah, right? same here. And I was... Some like, of my I'm mates are very pissed he off at that. He hasn't started the last few games and they've got Berg now as well. So I think it's time to jump off the Ludstrom train, but he's given us a parting gift. Um... But yeah, I think they're good value for it. I don't, you know, they just don't, they haven't rocked at all this season. You know, they're just steady, 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 steady. They're going to hit 40 points. The only thing I could see with them is maybe they do hit 40 points. See that as that mark that we're, we're not going to get relegated. They're not going to get relegated anyway. But I've heard a few other players kind of talking about that and how, you know, we're not looking at that, but we'll be delighted to get over that kind of thing. And I just wonder if they will kind of slacken off a wee bit. But, you know, they're not in the kind of competitions we are. They have much less games. And they actually know what they're doing and have a, a an identity and a tactical setup that really, really works well. And no one seemed to kind of figure it out yet. So I see them being right there in fifth, sixth till the end of the year. And then I also think Spurs um, obviously had a great result there uh, just in their last game. But I do think Mourinho will eke it out. You know, I do think he'll get them up there or thereabouts, even as bad as they've been. I know they'll be missing Kane right until the last couple of games of the season, but um, new signing looks good. And I just think he'll he'll do enough for them. So I, I think those teams could have us. I mean, if all those teams do well enough, we're immediately sixth or seventh, you know. Um, and I, I just think they, they will do. So you're going for sixth, seventh? Yeah. All right, David, where are you at? What do you think? Where are we finishing this season? I would say fifth or sixth was my my two choices. I I think it. I'll probably change my mind if we end up beating Chelsea on Monday. Yeah, yeah, that's the one that makes all the difference. It is literally like a six pointer by far our most like important game of the season so far. But yeah, in the next month or so, we play Chelsea and Tottenham and City and Everton. Yeah, Everton who are on top form. Uh, I mean, yeah, and then in the middle we have two Europa League matches. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, we have this break, but it's straight in at, like, the deep end, basically. It would be so good to see, like, obviously, hopefully not at our expense, but I'd love to see Sheffield United end up as high as what they are now. Because at the beginning of the season, everyone was saying there's no way their tactics are going to work in the Premier League. And like Colm says, no one has figured it out. Like, I don't know how many times you've, you've watched them this season, but when they're on here, I do try and watch their whole game. Because the way that that system is just nuts. Yeah. Like overlapping yeah. centre backs. There's like big yeah. six foot two, six foot three, like 14 stone guys just bombing down the wing. And the way it like overloads whatever side they're on, like it's crazy how well it's working and no one has figured it out yet. Even Liverpool, you know, really, really struggled with them. Exactly. Like they did not change their way whatsoever. And I watched a few of their games in the Championship where they're playing against obviously less quality opposition, just steamrolling them. But to see that type of thing work and Chris Wilder like, just stay true to it, I love seeing stuff like that. It's what, what makes the league so special to watch. And it seems that every year we get a team like a Sheffield United that just come up. Everyone's got, ah, oh, they're going to go straight back down. And then they just shock everybody. But the way they've done it has been way more impressive because it's a completely unique setup. So I really hope that if we are going to miss out, it's at their expense and not a Tottenham and a Mourinho. Mm. I think they're the strongest uh, promoted team in 20 years. I think I think so since... Fulham apparently in like 2000, 2001 or something. I remember when we played them and it was 3-3 when we came back into it. And I think I remember at the time, Colm, you said that, you know, none of their players would get in our team. Uh, I don't totally agree with that, actually. But 
it is obviously all about the team and a lot of uh, credit goes to the manager. You know, they haven't got that many individuals who really stand out. But uh, I do definitely think that Norwood or somebody will get in our team ahead of Andreas Pereira, that's for sure. But yeah, maybe not that many, of obviously. Um, do we, do we, we, we're going to be playing them at some point as well, I guess. I haven't really... We've not played them twice yet, No, we've we? not played them once, I think. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that, that will be an important match as well yeah. uh, when it comes around at some point. So yeah, look, there's a lot of still games to play. And yeah, it's true. We could finish. It. It's so bunched up in the middle of the table. It's crazy. And, you know, there's hardly any. A couple of points here, a couple of points there makes all the kind of difference, which is why, you know, whenever we do drop those games, whether it's Burnley, even, you know, a couple of points here or there, Wolves, if you manage to get a result there, makes such a massive difference at the moment. I think if you just look at the sample size so far, I mean, if you look at this season in terms of how we've performed home and away, I just don't see how anyone could be confident of us, you know, increasing our form you know I know Bruno's come in but he'd really have to hit the ground running maybe Paul becomes back quite soon maybe we get McTominay back in the next couple of weeks Rashford I mean we don't really know yet but it's still going to be for a few weeks and he's probably the most important out of that cadre and um, maybe even more important than Pogba really Um I just think it's so hard to say we'll we'll do better and um, because I think the one thing that's absolutely typifying this team uh, throughout all his tenure particularly this year is just that we have no control you know there's the uh, young squad of you know, inexperienced players that were kind of hot and cold anyway, and it's, it's proving that way. And Ole, I think, has proven that he can't elevate them with any kind of um, consistency. And I think that's his, his biggest feeling so far, that he just doesn't seem to be in control of these players in terms of how we go out and play and how we create and all that kind of stuff. And But he has elevated them in, like, you know, certain matches consistently. Yeah, but, but that's what I mean. I mean. That's why I said he can't do it consistently. You know, I mean, OK, we've done it against the big teams semi-consistently. Um but I'm, I mean, over the season, we, there has been no consistency at all. The only consistency we've had is that we've been good against the good teams and awful no, yeah, against the bad teams. I, I said this last time. There has been consistency that we've been generally awful <laughs> against pretty average teams. Okay, against eighty percent of the games, really we've been awful. Quite good yeah. against the big teams. It has been pretty consistently like that nearly the whole season, apart from the odd game where it's Norwich or Brighton or somewhere where we did pull off kind of like a relatively easy win. Yeah, but like I mean, thirty-five points from however many games or whatever we have at the moment, there, there is no consistency either like there is no consistency we're we're winning drawing and losing games ad you know it's just completely you know you couldn't you couldn't apply any kind of logic to it yeah no i know what you're saying and uh obviously you yeah in fact david i think when was the last time you were on was it november time when you recorded or was it early december or something just before the tottenham man city double header oh yeah exactly and at that time i think you said look i'm still kind of all laying but i'm starting to waver uh and then I guess yeah, we then had that Tottenham Man City, and it was it was it, it, not just even those two games. We had a kind of good. Come on, Dave, join me, join me. He's about to ask you, join me. <laughs> yeah. So where where are you at? Where are you at, David, at the moment on the kind of all lay in out bar- barometer? Still the same. He, I said it back then, and I'll say it now. He hasn't had enough of his full strength first team out on the pitch for me to judge how good he is as a manager and judge how good that eleven players can be. And until I see that, I don't want to condemn the guy to, you know, another another second. The the thing that's still in my mind is, uh, and Colm alluded to this earlier, Pochettino is still available, and Pochettino has a record of taking players and improving them. Solskjaer has the opposite right now, so it's just how long can you leave someone like that who presumably would want to come and want to get back into a job? Yeah. How long can you leave him sitting on the shelf, right? And I just don't want us to come to regret that. But I mean, the like the lifelong fan inside me says, "No, stick with the project." But sure, like you know, if 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 we get rid of social, we can just bring in like you know Berg or you know like maybe Jesper Blomfist or maybe we could bring in uh, I don't know. You know, any other player who's played for us before and has absolutely zero credentials to do the job. No, come on, come on, like, now you're just taking the piss. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, he's you not know. really getting out of the Premiership and one he's, and one. No, he's been a manager for many years. I mean, come on, show some respect yeah. at least, yeah. yeah. Like, all right, he's not like masses and masses of experience, but yeah, he's won like a league here and there. I, I mean, I know you're that. doing it just exactly, to because it's, push the... Yeah, I know you are. To me, so, there's yeah. so much of it is an emotional argument, which I think I get. I totally get it. I would love Solskjaer to do well and be a stalwart here. I would absolutely love that more than... Anything more than any player succeeding, we all want Solskjaer to succeed because he is Manchester United. He was there in '99. He's always such a likable character on the club. But when that is 
clouding so much of your objectivity, I think it becomes damaging. And I, I don't think we're just there. And I, but, I, but I see it in some fans. I, I think that they just, you, you know, you're talking about numbers, you're talking about how we're doing, you're talking about this, that, and the other. And it's just, it does just seem, ah, but it's Ole, and it's totally different. I mean, no one can argue that if it wasn't Ole, I mean, he's also a product of how Manchester United have been over the last five years because the board and Ed Woodward clearly want to steer away from this, you know, new appointment every year with a different manager who has a different idea of what he wants in the transfer market and this, that and the other. So he's, I think, as well, bought more time based on how Moyes, Van Hal and Mourinho have failed. But if it wasn't him, he'd be gone, you know. And I don't think, you know, to, to absolutely clarify my position, I want him there till the end of the season because I think there's no benefit in, in changing now in, in the middle because I think you're damning the next manager to an awful start regardless. I just don't think there's any win there so I think he should stay to the end of the season. If we can get Potch, I would take him immediately at the very start of the window. If we can get him at the start of the window and have him get the players he wants, you know, I think all the signings that have been made he would be totally happy with. I think Bruno's a player he would sanction, no issue. I think if we can engage with him early and the deals are being done to say, look, you sign straight away in the summer and you can have these players. We'll talk about, you know, who you want to sign. You are you have a, a seat with Edward Word and Judge and whatever else, however that works. Then that is what I would do immediately. And I would say, do you know what, Ole, thanks. Sorry it didn't work out, but I would make that decision immediately. If it's not him, i.e. Pochettino, and it's not immediate or there's not some standout candidate, I would probably stick with Ole. Just because I think in that circumstance where we're going to get another random manager with which hasn't really been researched, which is another bad, you know, kind of snap decision by the board, I would actually rather stay with Ole. And I think he is bordering on a pretty average to dreadful manager. And the only reason I would do that is because there's evidence that continuity probably helps. And also that in the transfer market and the team that he's building, I actually have quite a lot of faith. I just don't have any faith in his ability to manage that team and coach that team. That's the issue. But I think those are actually not as important factors as recruitment so for that reason I'd probably actually keep Ole past that unless we had a really clear plan to say right Pochettino first day of the window you're in here's your transfer budget let's go and I'd be really good about that my faith in our board to make that kind of clinical good sense decision is I mean I mean it couldn't be lower it literally couldn't be lower so whilst I am quite Ole out I kind of recognize that he's probably not the worst thing for the club at the moment and it's more just how that kind of awful the situation is but you know just another manager another big name manager or Ancelotti or a Nagelsmann or whatever if it's not researched and it's not the right fit then it's, it's we're just going back into that cycle you know but I do think Pochettino is the guy but yeah look that is the big question that I know you've always focused a lot on the coaching yeah and said listen we're not well coached not, and yeah not. it's a fair yeah. criticism but another thing I'd say is that that's not all on Ole at all because we do have a whole coaching team and I think maybe there is actually a big question mark about you know Carrick about uh, McKenna and what is their experience and you know are they the right people people uh, maybe we need more experienced coaches I mean alright Mike Phelan's in there as well and yeah I would say as well like, you know Alex Ferguson was not a great coach no. right but he was a great manager and he was able to pick great coaches and, which is what Ole isn't doing yeah you know? exactly he had great coaches he had assistant managers whether yeah. it was Kidd Kiroz yeah. McLaren even you know they were all in there and he had other people below that who were very well renowned coaches to me a lot of that is about the persona of the manager and his ability to manage the entire kind of entity not the entire club because that doesn't really happen anymore but I think Pochettino is that kind of guy where he he takes it on himself and makes those decisions. I don't see that kind of, gra- I've said it before, that gravitas, that personality, that embodiment of the manager on the pitch. You see it with Klopp, you see it with Guardiola, you saw it with Ferguson. I think you see it with Pochettino, although a lot of people say he's never won anything, he's never won anything, because he was, you know, going way beyond his means in terms of punching with that Spurs team, I think. And I think as soon as you put him in a big club, he would win things. Um, but to me, Ole just, I just don't see it with him. And I, I, it's not just a personality thing because I think Wenger had it as well in a very different way to, you know, in a more introverted way than maybe your Guardiola's, your Klopp's, your Ferguson's. But I just don't see it with, with Ole and it has to be Ole to make those decisions to say, well, do you know what, actually, Carrick? Do you know what, actually, McKenna? I'm not happy with the way this is working. We're going to change this and this. We're going to do this. And I, I just think he's a safe pair of hands. You know, he brought in Phelan. Was that the right, you know, was that the right thing or was that just a nod to the past because he was there when he was, you know, to me, he's trying to emulate Fergie no, in no, all these that ways. that was but, the right you know, thing. At that time, it was the right thing because the club needed stability because, you know, you, you need to think back to what was going on then, that there was a big mess in the background where Mourinho had fallen out. There were things, you know, there was a total, and that's why Ole always talks about, listen, it's a full, like, cultural reboot. We have to, like, get rid root and branch of a lot of things that were causing problems it's going to take time and yeah I you know I basically totally agree with what David was saying and yeah I mean Com, do you disagree with that point which is that basically Ole has never had a good enough team 
to really be doing much better than he is so I far totally agree with that point but it, for me it isn't it doesn't enable me to absolve him of all the sins I see every week essentially is what I'm saying so yes I agree we haven't had Pogba I think the club made a mistake in trying to keep him an unmotivated player who then becomes injured and, and you don't play all season I don't think that's necessarily I just think that's the club's fault I think we've put ourselves in that position so I, to me I can't give all this I can't just cut away the slack and write off this season and say well we can't possibly judge this person you know we can't look at these 40 games or however many games 60 games we play this year and say well you can't judge Ole on any of that because he didn't have his best players do you know what I mean to me that's far too much slack to give you I don't know. know what happens in the rest of the season will, does make a big difference like I'm not going to say like if we finish ninth that I still want Ole to stay for next season yeah, right yeah. you know there has to be some kind of uh, lowest bar and you know, it all depends on what happens in the Europa League where it happens yeah as I say I still think that we can finish fourth or fifth and if we get close to fourth then yeah I'm not going to say it's a total failure then but then yeah a lot goes on the Europa League then and how far we get in that it could all go well I mean if we win the Europa League I, I'm, I'm keeping them regardless Honestly, I'll say that now. Even if we finish ninth, well, that's it. Then you're not actually, you're not actually full Ole out. I mean, at this point, I, I, I'm saying at this point in time, I'm not saying he has to be sacked right this instant. I'm saying in the summer, if everything carries on the way it is at the moment, you know, then yes, I would want them out. But if we, if we enter the Champions League in any way, shape, or form, I think he deserves to stay. So there's, 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 oh yeah, definitely. There's caveats too because it's not black and white. Nick, you know, we, we, we want a position, and you're very forceful in trying to put everyone in their camps which is not a it's no issue and I know it's you know, yeah you, I know what you're doing like I no said. I'd actually say that that you've been stronger I've heard a stronger all layout message from you before whereas now you you know you're saying look if this happened if that happened I'd kind of still give him another go where there's a lot of fans who are done they're like whatever happens they're like no this guy has to but go but you can't be like right that as a guy. fan because things change you know if we win every game between now and the end of the well, season that know. is actually the thing that maybe a lot of you those know, people are quite fickle yeah, in it. but also there it's it's a reactionary thing Nick it's a it's a it's an emotional thing that you're saying in that particular moment don't get me wrong after Wolves I am hardcore all out an hour after Wolves you know, you kind of settle into it. You have to look at what's in front of you at the moment. But what do you mean after Wolves? Like, it's a nil-nil draw with a team who are actually dull. pretty damn good. That's and as you say, you're probably like about the same place as us in terms of squad quality yeah. right now. There isn't But it was a big game. It's a big game that you have to go and win. And also, that's the other point that I want to make. We're talking about points. We're talking about if we win this, if we win that, and this, that, and the other, and where we'll finish. And that's all kind of numbers. For me, there's also a big part of it that's the eye test. And I appreciate what you're going to say. We haven't had our squad. To me, there's still very little, very little discernible plan, quality, coaching that I can see going on. I can't see almost any progression between the Mourinho team that we all wanted rid of and this team, even though there's a bit of big gut out of players. Yeah, no, but like, I don't agree with that at all. Like, I think there's been a big progression since the start of this season and where we're at now. It's only in kind of flashes and it was in the flashes where we had close to a full team. Like, you know, the kind of periods where just... You know, it was just before Boxing Day. It was kind of that December up to Boxing Day when then Pogba got injured again, McTominay got injured again. That was kind of the best kind of period of the season so far. And it was the period where we had close to a fully fit team. Then again, it was kind of taken away from us. I mean, you say it was taken away from us through injury. I say it's just a team that isn't good enough. So we sometimes play well and we other times don't play well. That is just a mid-table but team. Has, That's just what normal football teams do. there's been a lot do. of improvement in certain players. Like, all right, you know, whether, okay, Fred... Uh, you know, Juan Bissaka is doing pretty well. Not even his attacking play has improved a lot. I'd say in the last couple of months from being pretty non-existent. In that he's trying it. I mean, it's still season. literally horrible to look at, but he's at least trying it. Yeah, it doesn't look pretty at all. But he's it's not been down to him that he's not got a few assists recently. It was down to poor finishing. Martial, Mata. He's actually set up like pretty good chances in like the last month or so. So you can't blame him for that if people are missing like pretty decent what, what you also can't do now. Nick- we should try Juan Bissaka left back. Just going to throw that out there. <laughs> go on, Why? go on. Let's hear that. I've not heard that from anybody before. So the guy, when he tackles, uh, like on the inside, when a guy cuts inside, always uses his right foot. Predominantly, the guy is going to be used as a defender. I mean, yes, his attacking has improved, but you want him as a as a defensive player first because he's just a wall. But he, he tackles weird when it's on the inside. If he's on, you know, playing left back, most teams these days the the right attacking outlet cuts inside. I think he's going to be more effective against that. And it, moving forward, our left hand side attacking wise is fixed, whether Pogba goes or not. We're going to have Fernandez or Pogba there playing the left kind of central midfield role, and then Rashford or Martial. We don't need to worry about attacking outlets on the left, but we absolutely have to on the right. And Wan-Bissaka doesn't offer enough there. And just the 
like the fantasy football manager in my mind goes, how good would Brandon Williams be at right back in a team that lacks adventure on the right hand side? And would Wan Bissaka be decent at left back? I don't know what you guys think about that, but it's just the way he tackles is. It, it, it makes me think he would he would not be out of place as a left back. It's a hot tech, Dave. I'll give you that. I don't think it'll be any use for one particular reason. He's totally, totally right footed, and he's not even good with his right foot. So I think if you put him on the left and ask him to play with his left foot a lot of times, he's always going to be receiving the ball and looking forwards. Now, he can always come back in on his right, but then that becomes totally ill-functioning. You, you know, Brandon Williams actually has a good bit of quality on both feet and can kind of play that well. But broadly speaking, it's always a bit of an issue, aside from the, the unbelievably world-class left-backs that have gone down in history as right-footers. It's an exceptionally small, small number who actually managed to make that, that change. And I think... The issues you see with his feet in terms of his touch and his control and his gangly Bambi on ice style and his lack of quality and in, in kind of technical passing and crossing and stuff would just be exasperated completely on the left. As I mean, I think they're already a big spotlight is shone on them on the right, which I don't actually think is all Aaron Wan Bissaka's fault. I think it's entirely Manchester United's fault for going like a decade or more without buying a right winger. I just think it's such a galling, galling feeling of ours that we've never put anyone on and, and Dan James is not the answer uh, certainly not yet and he should not have played anywhere near this amount of games he's not just Manchester United starting right winger because he can run fast it's 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 absolutely awful and even tactically we just expose wan I think because we just say here see that whole channel you just gallop up and down there do your stuff defensively which is class and then also be class and attack he's not class and attack and it just exposes what is already a weakness in his game and I just think it's... But do you not think he's been better recently? Marginally, and I do agree with you, I think he's been marginally better in that he's been trying more um, just because I think he feels we need it. Although I still think the base level of quality just isn't there. I mean, you're saying about a few crosses. I mean, he had that cross for Delo, um against Wolves right at the end. And um, he had a few yeah. crosses the game before. But also, Nick, what I was going to say to you is, yes, okay, those crosses in isolation were decent and they were chances that people probably should have scored. Anyone can get an assist from any one given cross. Over the 90 minutes, for all the times he gets the ball in the attacking third and what he does with it, it's per. No, but if he creates uh, two or three chances in a game, that's you it's, can't it's, expect it's, that much no, more. It's, no, it's, you, right you can if you're getting in behind or if you're getting the ball that much more. I mean, if we're dominating teams have 67% possession and he gets the ball 20 times on the right-hand flank and he creates one chance, that's actually not that good. But nor should it be entirely up to him, which is kind of my point about what the actual problem is. Because what did Dan James create ahead of him? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, to me, it's it's he should be a foil or should be, he should be linking with his right right midfielder or right winger. It just doesn't happen because there isn't one. Well, that is part of the problem that he hasn't had his consistent player, I guess, in front of him to try and link with. I mean, I guess James has been the one who's played the most around there. But yeah, that position has been one of the ones that's chopped and changed a lot. So it's been difficult for him to form an understanding with anyone. I think he's having a, a good first season in a tough first season, i.e. a tough one for us as a club, not for him personally really yeah, and I think he'll be even better next year I don't think he'll ever be an attacking a good quality attacking fullback I, I really don't I don't think there's enough technical quality there whether we are good enough with a right winger like if you put Jane Sancho in front of him you probably don't need him to be that good to be quite honest and you can just say Sancho don't you worry about defending because you know he has it locked up as mm. long as you have good attacking threat from left back which I think we probably will moving forward from either Shaw or um, Williams or a signing so I'm quite happy with him but I think this season particularly, I think he could have been rotated out. I know Dallow's been injured, but th- th- there will be times moving forward when we're playing teams that just sit out against us where Dallow will be a better choice. And I, I definitely, I think that's that's pretty clear. Yeah, actually, Dallow's not had anywhere yeah, near enough games and it's all been down to injury. Yeah. Uh, you know, the few flashes he has look like somebody who can it would have I'm sure he would have been involved a lot more uh, if he'd been fit this year and you know we we obviously remember players like Pogba, Martial, Rashford, McTominay when they're injured but there has been a lot of these fringe players who've been out which has made it even more of a problem when we've lost players here and there uh, you know I think in all of that the the biggest place where we do still disagree is that, you know, you say that you don't see any improvement in our place since kind of the start of the season. Not, not, not any. I, that I don't agree with because I think there is more than enough signs of big improvement. The one thing I'll say in terms of what I see is I do think we're better at the back. I think we're better with the ball at the back and I think we're better without the ball at the back. I think we keep a higher line now. I think we move the ball around better in large parts down Maguire, but also Lindelof. I think we control games a lot better. You know, all the games we've lost or drawn against the mid-table teams, we have dominated possession-wise and look comfortable doing it. And we also see Wambasaka, or sorry, Wambasaka, Maguire and Lindelof win a lot of balls around the halfway line. Even Wolves, who've pre- previously been able to come to us and really 
you know, with Neves, play us off the park, essentially, or at least really compete with us in a very even way. Even, we, we really dominated them, to be quite honest, and they were completely playing on the counter. Now, that's probably where they want to play, but we still did it to them. So I see that kind of back spine as as being improved, definitely. And I know some people don't like watching us try and play it out, out, out of the back against City and Liverpool, which we have done very recently. I really love seeing that. To me, at least that's an attempt to move forward in our football, because we didn't previously do that. And I'm, I'm happy to see it, even if it's harem scarum stuff we bit at the time, because we're not actually that great at it. The head maybe isn't that great at it. Wamsack is maybe not that comfortable. But we are improving in it and we're doing better. And we, you see those times where we release Fred from from kind of the press and he's able to take it in turn or Bruno's able to take it in turn or whatever. And suddenly we're in behind. The problem is once we get to that stage, it's just completely useless, completely useless. And when we build the play up slowly, which we do quite a lot, it's also completely useless. Yeah, but it's completely useless because we've had to rely on either Pereira or Lingard yeah. to be and making that final pass. And they're not the guys who are going yeah, to do if it. You let me finish speaking. That's a big part of it. And that's what I was thinking today. And that if you look at it in terms of I see our play out the back much better and we spent last summer all our budget on defenders and now that's that's improved. So that, for me, that's a tick in the box to say, well, we've recruited these players and I've personally seen, I don't think our defence is that much more solid in actual defending. You know, I think the set piece issue is a huge issue that we haven't been able to address throughout the yeah, year. Yeah, that is a huge issue to be fair. And it's like, you know, beyond a joke Because it's now. not the playing staff that there's an issue with or it's the coaching staff, it's the zonal marking system because we have the players to yeah, be able to fair. really, Coaches really easy. easily defend those situations. So again, that's a that's that's an X. But then there's also the tick of me saying, but broadly our defensive play in terms of how we play the ball out and the shape we keep is better. And if the next windows are all focused on attacking players and midfielders and we get the same, you know, uh, increase in what I'm seeing and the same, you know, positive kind of product at the end of it, then, you know, it could all work out quite well. It could all work, work out quite well. And that's why I'm quite happy if, if Ole is saying that he's in charge of that recruitment process, because I think that's the one thing, that's the one thing I can point at and say, well, that's going well. Everything else for me is completely up in the air and a lot of it's really bad. But that's the one thing I can keep coming back to and say, well, actually, I can trust this guy because even in two years, whatever manager comes in after, I think we'll be in a much better place. Yeah, and I think that's something I've said before that, you know, I like the team for players that is being put together. Yeah, I mean, I agree. We're nowhere near like where we want to be in terms of play style. I mean, David, where are you on that particular question? Since the start of this season or the start of whenever Ole came in, I mean, I've always said that I see this season as kind of a new start and don't think too much about last season because of so much change in the squad. Uh do you think that our play has improved under Ole this season? Not drastically. Uh, it's just been so sporadic, up and down, game to game. Um, I mean, at times I've looked and thought, like, obviously you see us away at Man City and the way we played there. I mean, we look like a world-class counter-attacking team. It, it's just it's so sporadic. I mean, everything that you would want in a good team, we've demonstrated this season just never in the same game for an extended period of time. So it's nice yeah. to know that the, the idea is there, that this can be a team that plays out at the back, beats the press, advances forward and can hopefully get creative players playing fast players in behind. And it's nice to know we can hit teams in the counter-attack and it's nice to know we can absorb pressure. It's all there and it's all been demonstrated, just never in the same game consistently. Uh, as, as far as overall play, I mean... Uh, I'm judging it on how frustrated I get, and I still get as frustrated now as, as I did at the start of the season. I, I don't think we're as well coached as we should be, but I think the, the ideas are all there. And I mean, I've never played at a professional level. I don't know how long it takes to get a strategy to stick when you're training with each other Monday to Friday every day and playing a couple of times a week. It, it seems like it should have came together by now, but the signs are there that we know how to execute each part of the game plan. It's just putting it all together now and who knows what the right coaching team is for that to get it to happen week in, week out, like you see with some of the other teams. I mean, you look at the way when Klopp came into Liverpool, there's no way those players were immediately responding to that kind of demand that he was putting on them. And then he sticks with it, sticks with it, and now you see what used to be regarded as average players just performing at like a world-class level week in, week out. There was a really interesting thing today posted on Twitter. It was it was basically Ole has played, managed 68 games for us now, I think it was. Um, and someone took a snapshot of how different managers performed after 68 games. And they took Ole, they took uh, Ferguson, they took Busby, they took Klopp, they took um, Mourinho at United and someone else. And just a breakdown of, you know, what their win percentage was, how many games they'd won, drawn, lost, how many goals they'd scored and stuff like that. And, you know, Fergie's, Klopp's and Ole's win percentages were all pretty much similar. I think it was 50, 51, 52 or something like that. You know, so really no big difference in terms of that. Ole had lost a lot more games than they had. And also 
Ole's goal difference was something like 33. Klopp's was something like 68. Fergie's was something like 59 or something like that. I'm making that up top of my head, but that was the gist of it. And to me, it just highlighted that it's not actually the win and loss ratio that's the big issue sometimes. It's the style of play. And to me, the style of play is still poor. The goal difference is poor that we aren't creating. And I know, Nick, you're going to say it's because we're playing with Pereira and Lingard and, you know, Rashford's been injured. And I get that. But I just still think you would see more of an imprint of how he wants to play if there was actually a way he wants to play that was kind of being routinely worked on through training and, and really corely focused in on by a team of coaches and a manager that were able to get that out of a player because whilst those players are poor I still don't think it's unrealistic to think a good manager you know great 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 managers arguably generational managers come into any squad and will get uplift and you'll see an identity other managers just need to buy well maybe they're not as good at that aspect and that's fine because there's lots of different things that make a good manager but other others kind of want to just plug gaps with just by better players and of course that's going to work in a certain context as well better players are going to mean you perform better it's that's one of the most simple and basic things about football it's why the rich clubs do the best um but and i think Ole's capable of doing that part of it i don't think he's capable of doing the first part of it the way Klopp or someone else can yeah well, yeah, I, yeah i don't think he can do it like Klopp can either because i don't think he's that kind of manager that has this right this is my philosophy and this is what everybody's going to do every week, week in, week out, like Pep, like Klopp. That's why everybody always compares to that. But yeah, there is other ways of being a manager as well. And I do think from the bits we start hearing and, you know, bits come out from whether it's Lingard or Martial, you know, players mention little things here and there. I think he's a player who focuses more on a specific player and trying to improve that specific player in certain ways. Uh, You know, Rashford talked about when Ole first came in and he was trying to show me, you know, how I needed to take an extra second on my finish, a bit of composure. Martial, you know, there was also talk like, it was, I think it was about a month ago, like uh, both of them mentioned something about we've had a big focus on like heading and like trying to be the, you know, number nine player in the box. And within like a few weeks of that, both Martial and Rashford scored headed goals that you normally don't see them scoring that much off. Uh, so it's these kind of things that I would pick out where there's definitely specific things that have been worked on that are working. And yeah, it's not about a philosophy because it is different and he will go very different into different matches. And maybe that is more like a Mourinho we were used to coming in and will chop and change in different games. Whereas, you know, before that we had Van Hal, who was more in your Klopp, Pep way of just saying, this is our philosophy, possession, possession, possession. And, uh, you know, not all managers do do it in the same way. So like I say, him, I think he's focusing more on certain areas or saying, yeah, you know, as an attacking unit, uh, we're going to do this and that. And, you know, on numbers, you know, there were some stats thrown out about the number of goals scored by, say, Rashford, Martial and Greenwood mm-hmm. versus Salah, Mane and Firmino. And, you know, it was a similar amount of goals that those three have scored this season. Yeah, it's in the midfield though where there has been a massive lack this season, um, for sure. You know, I again would of course point to like the personnel, uh, but yeah, far. they can yeah. do better yeah. even. Uh, you know, especially when you end up the the biggest problem was when you had Pereira in centre mid. Um, so yeah, that has been the area where we have totally been lacking. And you know, when that is the most important area of the field, then that's why yeah, the whole team is going to fall apart. Um, but yeah, we hope now with Bruno and maybe yeah, McTominay is back in training that we're going to have a few more options going forward there. And hopefully, yeah, it should make the difference. So yeah, let's see from there. Uh, <clears throat> we do, like I say, have this kind of patch schedule restarting immediately. Chelsea Monday, we go away to Bruges, uh, two back-to-back away games. And yeah, our season can be defined, de- defined next, next week, basically. Uh, you know, Chelsea Monday, six-pointer, then, yeah, our most difficult game in the Europa that we've had so far. I think we played Bruges a few years ago. So yeah, I remember there was a lot of those in Bruges film jokes at the time. That's what I remember from it. Uh, so, yeah, definitely was relatively recently. Yeah, look, as usual, it should be a game. Obviously, everybody's expecting to win. But, yeah, you go away first. And I expect it to be a pretty awful game that we come back with like nil nil or maybe like one nil and take it to Old Trafford, to be honest. Uh, And uh, we'll see from there. And then, yeah, what is it? Watford, Bruges. We've also drawn Derby in the FA Cup. Wayne Rooney playing over there at the moment. So, yeah, nice little story over there. Um, that's, That's after those kind of three or four matches. So, yeah, there is still plenty to play for this season. And what happens in all... 
I, I mean, I don't. You have to go. I want. I want. I don't want to put any like thing saying right. If he does this, if he does that, he has to stay. Because you know, if you just miss out on top four by like a few points, or if you get to like the Europa League final and lose it, it's not like a total failure. So yeah, we have to just see how it all plays out from now. Uh, I think we've all made our kind of predictions for these for the season. But what about this Chelsea game in particular? You, they'd not make. Did they make any signings in this window? I don't think they made any at all, did they? No, they didn't make any. Yeah, even though their transfer ban was kind of officially over. Lampard was actually quite openly pissed off about that. He made a couple of comments on how, you know, other clubs who are competing with have bought in players and we haven't bought in anybody. So we have to, and he's got players like Giroud who'd want to be anyone, anywhere apart from Stamford Bridge at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, he, which is, yeah, I think, Several clubs try to pick him up, and yeah, he would. I think he was probably another player we might have looked at as well, to be honest. Um, but I'm sure Chelsea did not want to give a player like that to us or Spurs and help in that top four race at all. But yeah, David, you're feeling confident for this Chelsea game? Can we win this game? Oh, we can win it for sure. Um, I just, I mean, I, I think Lampard's avoided a lot of the criticism that has been leveled at Solskjaer. Uh, it was good to see a couple of the, the guys in the media. I think Roy Keane actually kind of had a go at it saying, well, why is Lampard not getting as much criticism as Ole is? Uh, it's one of those games where you probably normally take a draw, but with it being a six-pointer, I think we have to go for it. But I do think that the way Chelsea set up doesn't play into our hands in terms of being able to counter-attack a team. They can sit quite deep. So, to be honest, I'd expect a, maybe a boring game and... Maybe we can scrape a late win, but wouldn't be overly confident and probably say a, a draw was going to be the the most likely result. Um, I, I really hope we win. It's two massive games within the space of four days um, at the bridge. And I just feel that we've obviously done them on the first day of the season and then the cup as well. So I think they're kind of due a bit of a, a bit revenge, really. Um, yeah, we smashed him on the first day, oh, right? Unbelievable. That was Everybody the peak was, of the season. Uh... <laughs> but, uh... It did flatter the scoreline that day, I remember. Well, I remember some people very sagely pointing out that we'd actually played quite poorly and probably statistically deserved to lose that game. Um, Not lose, but so, I don't yeah, think but we But certainly up until I think the 60 70th minute when they basically gave up after the second goal went in. I think um, I remember like, the XG said it should have been 3-2 or something yeah. like that. Um, but, but yeah, so I just feel they're just staying in the tail now. Um, but they've been so... They've been so average lately and so leaky at the back all year um so i don't know we'll just see a lot of it's a lot of it's hard to tell because you know how's bruno gonna perform is a gallo gonna play what's Martial gonna do i think it's a real tough one after this little mini break to see how united come back into it but it's certainly going to be a, a big defining one i think if we lose that's fourth gone so um i think they know that yeah probably probably if we lose that then yeah you i'm not betting on that anymore at all. Uh, so, yeah, we we'll stay from there. So, yeah, like I said, maybe even you'd say, I, I said before earlier in the show, I think it'll be a draw just because Chelsea will be happy with a draw. And, like, are we really, really going to push it? Because, as you say, if we lose it, then it's almost like top four is over. Whereas if you get a draw, you kind of think, yeah, we yeah. might still be able to make it up. And also, like, we're missing Rashford, we're missing Paul. You know, we're just lacking creativity in that sense. So if, if it isn't going to be Bruno, it ain't going to be anyone. So it's it, I don't see a high-scoring game, you know, unless it just goes mad. No, I don't think it'll be a high-scoring game. It'll be, like, pretty tight and, like, yeah, maybe we'll be able to take it, like, 1-0. Uh, I think it might be set up like that. I'm sure we'll be set up to be playing on the counter-attack and Chelsea will be doing most of the play that's the way I expect it to go but yeah let's see how it plays itself out like I say we've got Bruges then Watford then Bruges again so yeah somewhere in that period we'll definitely come back Uh, usual shout out to please uh, tweet uh, share and we're now on YouTube so yeah started getting a couple of comments on there Uh, I think not that many people realise we're on YouTube now so if that's your favourite source then yeah feel free to go and subscribe on YouTube um, but yeah, all comments always appreciated. Thanks to David for your second appearance of the season. That's actually more than Imran, who's supposedly like a core member of the podcast team. But you really like you've managed two, and he's only on one so far this season. Pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me again. I really appreciate it. No worries. Uh, all right. Yeah, we'll see you on the next one. Great. Take care, guys.